Well, good morning. My name is Chris Quinn. I'm the youth pastor here at Portland Community Church. And actually what you've noticed this morning, you've probably seen a few youth hanging around. It's a youth Sunday. So we've got youth uh, doing some ushering. They're in the band. We got one on the camera. So we're excited. We're, we're glad we get to be a part of this. Um, as a church, we've been going through a series called Putting God's Power to Work in Your Life, Working Through the Book of Joshua. And I actually want to start by telling you a story about a famous professional athlete. You'll see him on the screen. His name is Josh Hamilton. Now, in 1999, Josh Hamilton was the number one overall draft pick for the Tampa Bay Devil Rays of the amateur draft. So he was the number one amateur player in the country. But within a few years, years, he quickly uh, dove deep into a drug and alcohol addiction, so much to the point that he failed several drug tests and was suspended for an entire season. And as a result, he actually had to, he, he went out of baseball for a while. And a few years later, once he had kind of sobered up, he got another chance with the Texas Rangers. And he took advantage of that opportunity and actually eventually became the American League MVP for the Texas Rangers. He took them to two straight World Series appearances, lost both, uh, one to my San Francisco Giants. Uh, no bragging. And, uh, and so Josh seemed like he was on a great road, and then he did this video for this Christian ministry called I Am Second to, to give his testimony of how Christ has changed his life and gotten him out of this drug habit. Well, unfortunately, the story does not end there, and it does not end well. It, he has had, in, in the past, since that video came out, he has had three very public and very embarrassing relapses where he has gone back into, and he's had to confess it, he's had to suffer some consequences. And in the public eye, he has lost a lot. And now his story is more about what could have been versus what was, versus this talent, this, incredible, this incredibly gifted young man. And instead now, he's more associated with failure than he is with his successes. And so if we're honest with ourselves, we can relate to Josh Hamilton, not necessarily in the sense that all of our big mistakes and failures are out in the public realm and we have to do these big apologies, but we can relate in the sense that there are certain things in our lives that we have, uh, that we've made these big failures where we feel like, and just feel the weight of that, we feel guilt and shame for them, and, and maybe they're really private, they were hidden, but they, we still feel the guilt of that, or we have these continual things that we struggle with that we just cannot seem to get over, and so we have to ask the question, why is that? Why do we continue to struggle in these things? I think most of all is because we don't understand what the gospel really is. We don't understand what the gospel really is, and by extension, we don't understand who God is, what he is like, what he is all about. We believe that, we believe this lie that our sin, whether big or small, that God could be finished with us, that God could ignore us and leave us to figure this out on our own and give up working on us. But we forget this beautiful truth, and this kind of summarizes the gospel a bit in Matthew chapter 9, verse 12. You can see it on the screen, is that God came to heal the sick, that Christ came not for the righteous, but for, for sinners. He did not come for the healthy, but he came for the sick, like a doctor to come and heal those who are in need of health. And so when we see this, we all, like Josh Hamilton and all of us, need to take a moment and remember who we are, that we were in desperate need of God's grace. And that even still, as Christians, we still need this because we have these moments where we make mistakes, that we fail, and and we often believe that these things are fatal and that, that that's the final thing, that that cuts it off, that leaves us outside the grace of God. But this is what we're going to learn this morning, that in the eyes of God, there are no such things as fatal failures, but opportunities by which we can respond to God's immeasurable grace. And so when we, what we're going to look at this morning is we're going to see how Israel responds to their failure and their confession of the failure and God dealing with it. And then their response and now living this new life that God has given for them and moving forward in it and continuing the plan that God has laid out for them in the nation of Canaan. And so we're, this morning, we're going to look at four responses that we must, have as, we must have as a result of our sins and failures so that they don't ultimately defeat us. 
So I invite you to go ahead and turn to Joshua chapter 8. We're going to be on page 219 in the brown hardcover back Bibles in the seat in front of you. I actually encourage you to have something like that this morning so that you can kind of look at it because uh, there's a lot of information in this story. So I'm going to kind of go over bits and pieces, but there's, there's some stuff in the middle that I'm going to kind of summarize for us, kind of the battle pieces of it because it's just so much information. It would take a lot of time and we could be here until about one o'clock, which you know, I I mean, I can do that, but I'm sure you don't want that, okay? So we're going to go ahead and we're going to start, uh, I'm going to kind of, here's kind of just set up to where we are today, just so that we know, we kind of get the background so we're set up. Joshua chapter 6, you have the story of the city of Jericho, where God miraculously uses the Israelites to conquer them, and then right after that, we have the story of this man named Achan who took what we call devoted things. They were supposed to take the things that they got for plunder and give them back to God. They weren't supposed to take them for themselves, but Achan took it for himself, put it in his tent, and hid it from everybody. And then when they go to the next city of Ai to try and conquer that city, they go in overconfident, they, don't, they go in without a plan that is given to them by God and ultimately they fail and God reveals to them it's because of a sin that is in the camp and eventually Achan is revealed. He doesn't confess. He doesn't come forward. He is revealed. He is caught and then he actually has to be executed as a result so that the sin can be dealt with and taken care of. So now here we are. They're getting ready to attack I once again and so let's begin chapter 8 verse 1. Then the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go up and attack Ai. For I have delivered into your hands the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. You shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, except that you may carry off their plunder and livestock for yourselves and set an ambush behind the city. So notice that right off the bat, we see something totally different from what happens in Joshua chapter 7. Right off the bat, it's the Lord who starts this process. He is the one who begins it. And what he says is he says to Joshua, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged. And the reason he's telling them this is that so that he doesn't dwell on what just happened, this massive mistake, this failure that they had gone through as a nation, this sin. He says, move on. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Don't dwell on that. Don't stay there. Because the reality is, is we have to remember as human beings, we, are, we live in a broken world and we are broken ourselves. And so failures, mistakes, and sin are going to happen. These are things that we should expect because we're human beings. We can't expect that somehow we're just going to walk out, we give our life to Christ, and then suddenly now, well, I guess I'm going to walk in a perfect righteousness for the rest of my life. I'm going to be the perfectly good person. That's not how that works. And so we have to remember that it's not about these failures, but it's about how we respond to these failures. And it, this is what shows our depth and maturity in our relationship with Christ. Because we, if we stay in a place of self-pity, where we just, we hold on to this guilt, we hold on to this shame, then we forget what Romans 8.1 says, which is that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We can't forget that. That's really important. But we also need to remember the other side of the coin that we can't just brush off sin and say, ah, I'm forgiven. It's no big deal. God's cool with it. You know, I, we have to recognize that God isn't cool with it and that sin is serious and it has consequences that need to be dealt with. And so that we have to have an accurate view. And so instead what we do is we choose to recognize that the sin happened. We repent of it, meaning that we say, that was sin. I did it. I acknowledge it. And now I want to move on from it. We confess it. We give it to God. And then we just walk in forgiveness. We move forward in it because God's going to use this failure, this sin, this mistake. He's going to use it for our good and for our growth and for his glory. And so when we look at this story, there are two major differences between the two setups to this battle. First of all, like I already said, God is the one who initiates this plan and he gives them the plan. I mean, he's telling them right off the bat, look at this, I'm going to deliver the king and the people into your hands. This is yours now. Now that you've dealt with this, this is yours. And then he also gives them a little bit of a plan, set an ambush. So that's the first thing. But the second thing that's different is that God allows for them to take plunder from the city this time. So the irony of the story is that if Achan had simply waited one more chapter, okay, one more chapter, just wait, buddy, chill. Like if he had just waited a little bit longer, he would have gotten what he was looking for. But this is what we often do. And this is what sin kind of, you can kind of categorize sin in this way is reaching for things to kind of grasp, grasp it for ourselves 
instead of waiting on God to provide. Because here's what we have to remember. God is a good God and does not want to withhold good things from us. And where we get ourselves in trouble is when we try and grasp for things for ourselves that we think we need and we think that we want. And so that's the huge difference is already God is saying, go for it. You've devoted that first battle to me and now you can take of this for yourself. So now I'm going to kind of explain the next basically 20 verses um, in two little bits about how the battle goes down. So we're going to have a map on the screen. Okay, so here's kind of how it goes down. Yay, it works the service. Okay, so here's how, how the battle kind of happens. Joshua is going to come from the north with a group of an army. Okay, he's going to come with the main contingency. But it says, God said, set an ambush behind the city. And so Joshua picks out 30,000. That's 10 times more than their original battle plan that they had when they just sent 3,000. So you could call this overkill or just being really prepared. Okay. So behind the city, you'd have 3,000, but then they're also supposed to have a, another set of 5,000 that were to be in between Bethel and I as a, like, a cutoff of reinforcements and supplies. I mean, we've, if you've watched historical like, war movies like I have, you've seen this before. Like This is a plan that is in a lot of movies, and we've seen this happen, and as we'll see in a few minutes, the plan works to absolute perfection because what they're doing is they're trying to draw out the king of Ai and his people towards Joshua and the main contingency of the army and then as soon as that group is out as soon as the city is emptied then that 30,000 ambush behind the city to the south will come in and take over and so what we see going on here is that Joshua is being told the battle plan he's being given these things of what to do but what we need to remember, and when we look back at this whole first section, this, when we're looking at verses 1 through 13, is that God is the one who is initiating all of this. And so our first response that we need to have is that we need to embrace full forgiveness of our sinful past and that God enables us to have gracious clarity for his will. It's this amazing thing that happens. And so sin happened. We messed up. We made a mistake. But when we come before Jesus and when we come to him knowing that every sin was put on him on that cross, that when we come to him that we, can, we are fully forgiven because he was perfect. So no matter what it is we've done, no matter how bad we think we've screwed up, it was all paid for on the cross in the past. We need to remember that. We need to embrace that. And oftentimes what people do is they put this burden on themselves of like this phrase, oh, you just need to forgive yourself for the things that you did. That is a huge burden to put on people. Really what we need to do is to really just say, I have been forgiven by God and I need to let go of that guilt and shame because that's me holding on to it. That's not me embracing the full forgiveness that Christ offers. And so when we embrace that and understand that this is who we are, that if we have given our life to Christ, we are fully forgiven. Everything is paid for no matter what it is, past, present, or future, it's taken care of. And then when we do that, when we are able to embrace that full forgiveness, then we can look ahead and see gracious clarity that God opens up the doors and we're able to see what he has planned for us, what he is wanting to do with our lives. And we see that with Joshua when he tells them, okay, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged, here's the plan. We can see more clearly when we have been forgiven what God has designed for us, what God desires for us, and what we mostly need to remember is that we are completely dependent on God for anything that we do in our lives. Look at this verse from John 15. I love this verse. John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I mean, Jesus is very, very clear here. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The problem happens, why we give ourselves into sin is we start to believe that, okay, maybe now, now that I'm a Christian, now I can handle this, I can take care of this myself. We forget that we need to depend completely on Jesus for everything, even living the good and righteous life that he has called us to live. And the problem is, is that when we become overconfident and maybe even prideful and believe that we can handle things for ourselves is when we immediately open ourselves up for failure. Because we start to believe this lie of self-sufficiency and then we start to instead agree that apart from him, I can do anything. That's not the truth. Apart from him, you can do 
nothing. And guys, this is actually really good news. This is really good news for us to understand that apart from him, we can do nothing because then he is the one that enables us. He is the one that transforms us. He is the one that works in our lives to make us the kind of people that he desires for us to be. So that's the beautiful part of this whole thing. Okay, moving on. So in the next section, 14 through 23, I'm going to summarize it again. We'll have the map on the screen again because we're back in the battle. And when we get back in the battle, the plan happens. Joshua sends his contingency from the north. They come out because that's the direction that the front of the city is facing. And it draws out the king of Ai. And the king of Ai goes out and says, hey, cool. This is the same thing that happened before. We're going to send. He just empties, completely empties his entire city. So, I mean, even now when you think about it, the 30,000 was major overkill. But, hey, God told him to do it, so he did it. So then the 30,000 come in, take over the city, and they set it on fire. Okay? And, they, and it falls into, as it's described in the story, a heap of ruins. Now, the ironic thing is that the word I in Hebrew actually means heap of ruins. So this is a name that the Hebrews gave to the city after they had conquered it. They started calling it I because they turned it into a heap of ruins. So it had a different name in the Canaanite language. So it's, we don't know for sure what that is. But what we can see here is there's something going on here that could make us uncomfortable and that a lot of people have used against our faith to try and prove that this isn't a true faith. It's that there's this level of brutality that happens in these stories that Joshua carries out. As we'll see, he wipes the city completely clean, kills everybody in it. And so some people look at it and go, this is a genocide. This is God mandating and justifying a genocide of a people. So there's a few things we need to keep in mind why I don't think that is and why God is doing something that is actually good and just and right for him to do. First of all, the Canaanites were a wicked and awful people, okay? Committing such things as part of their religious services, child sacrifice was a prominent feature, okay? That should make us all really uncomfortable because that's awful, okay? They also had cultic prostitution, so some things along that. They, had, they exploited the poor and the weak. I mean, these were people that were awful, some of the worst people that we have found in all of human history. They were awful people. So this is God's even saying, he even said 400 years before this, he said, the sin of the Amorites and the Canaanites has not been fulfilled yet. I'm giving them more time. He was giving them more time to turn away from their wicked ways to see how bad it was and to stop, but they didn't. They didn't stop. And so this is God's way of kind of clearing this out. Now, the other part of this to keep in mind is that I don't think this was a full clearing of every single Canaanite because they didn't, that didn't happen. Uh, Canaanites show up again later in the biblical story. What I think is actually happening is you have a strategic destruction of military outposts and even of spiritual like power within the city. So basically Joshua is wiping out all of those who have been leading the, the nation in this way to, to do these kind of horrible things that I talked about earlier. And so God is wiping this clean because what he wants to do is he wants to use the promised land and have the nation of Israel be a light to the rest of the world of who God is and what he is really like so that everyone, all the other nations would look at them and say, this is what God is like and God is a good, gracious, loving God and that is not possible when you have things like child sacrifice happening, okay? So this is God's way of dealing with this, of taking care of it. And so we'll actually see and we'll see what happens, but the Israelites don't actually fully carry out the plan that God had given them in terms of this removal of the people. But it's kind of hard for us sometimes in a sensitive culture to see these kinds of things, and it, it gets kind of difficult. But what we can see for Joshua here is we don't know if he had any moral qualms about what he was doing, but we do know that he looked ahead at what God was calling him to do about this kind of conquering and going through this country, and he was saying, He's probably looking at going, this is going to be really hard. This is going to be really difficult. And so that's the same that it, it can be for us. When we look forward and look ahead at what the Christian life is, we know that it's going to be hard. But this is what our second response is supposed to be, is that we commit ourselves to fully, fully obey his commands no matter how hard they are. 
Because here's the thing, the Christian life is described by Jesus as a continual denying of ourselves and taking up of his life. And I don't know about you, but that's hard. That's hard work because we are people that want to take things up for ourselves, that want to do things for ourselves, that see something and say, hey, that looks nice. I want to go for that. I want to do that. I want to eat that, you know, delicious food. Go for it. Instead of saying, no, what is, how is my life going to glorify Christ? How am I going to live a life that pleases him? This is the way of Jesus, of denying of ourselves, of, of saying to him, we're going to live our life for you. But we have to keep remembering when we get to this point, because this could start to sound like, okay, now here's another list of rules I got to follow. This is a religion. And it starts to get kind of boring or kind of way heavy on us. But here's the beautiful thing about what we teach and what the gospel really is, is that even trying to be good, you can't do it. You are not good enough to do good. And that's a beautiful thing because what happens when you believe in Christ, when you give yourself to him, when you come before him, lay yourself at his feet, he gives you his Holy Spirit. And that, that is what enables you to be able to obey his commands, even if they're really hard to do. And so if there are things in your Christian life that you're looking at and you're saying, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to raise my kids so that they can follow Christ more closely. I don't know how to study the Bible for myself. I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to share Christ with my coworkers, my neighbors, my friends. I don't know how to deal with difficult people. I don't know how to deal with a bully at school. Any of those things, you can come before Jesus and say, Jesus, help. I need your help. I can't do this. I want to commit myself to doing this, but I need your help and your grace to do this because I can't do this on my own. We have to reach a point in our life that we submit and surrender completely to Christ and then radically and passionately just focus completely on him and go straight towards wherever he wants us to go and nothing else. But remember, his spirit gives you the power and the ability to do that. It is not something that you can do on your own, and God gives you that gracious ability to do that. Okay, we're going to continue reading. We're going to look at verse 24. We're going to start reading in verse 24, chapter 8. When Israel had finished killing all the men of Ai in the fields and in the wilderness where they had chased them, and when every one of them had been put to the sword, all the Israelites returned to Ai and killed those who were in it. 12,000 men and women fell that day, all the people of Ai. For Joshua did not draw back the hand that held out his javelin until he had destroyed all who lived in Ai. But Israel did carry off for themselves the livestock and plunder of this city, as the Lord had instructed Joshua. So Joshua burned Ai and made it a permanent heap of ruins, a desolate place to this day. He impaled the body of the king of Ai on a pole and left it there until evening. At sunset, Joshua ordered them to take the body from the pole and throw it down at the entrance of the city gate, and they raised a large pile of rocks over it, which remains to this day. Now remember, again, the brutality here seems harsh. It seems awful. But this is recompense for the wickedness and the evil that the Canaanites were committing. So this is kind of God's justice being poured out. And like we have to understand that for God to be good, he also has to do something about evil. And so that's what he's doing here. He's taking care of evil. He's addressing it. He's seen what they were doing and he is taking care of it. If God doesn't do that in some, in, in some way, shape or form, then he is not ultimately a good God. So we have to remember this is what he is doing. And so these people were giving themselves to these religious practices. And so they were getting their, the just penalty for what they had done. But when we look at this, Kind of the issue that's going on here is that God had called Joshua and the nation to do these kinds of things. And they were, again, to wipe out these wicked, evil rulers, these regimes, these spiritual, these spiritual services and religious practices in order to bring out this new kingdom. And why they were supposed to do that is God warned them in the law from Moses. He basically warned them that saying, if you don't get rid of these people, then they're going to be a thorn in your side and you're going to start to fall and give, in, give yourself into these things and become just like them. And we actually have the burden of knowing history and reading our Bibles. And so when you get to the story of the book of Judges, right at the beginning, you see that they say after Joshua dies, they don't follow through. And so some of these places continued to exist and then eventually influenced the nation of Israel to the point that they fell into it themselves. And in the way that the book of Judges describes it, it's a downward spiral that gets worse and worse and worse as time goes along. By the end of the, story, the book of Judges, it's so bad. 
The nation has fallen so far. They didn't take the time to obey and follow through with God, what God had said and to remove these evil, wicked sources of evil. And so when we look at our failures and mistakes and sins that we have committed, there's always a reason why. We have to understand that there's a reason, there's reasons why we do these things. There's sources that, that, that feed these things, that get us to do these things. Again, I'm going to split them into two different categories. There's exterior and interior sources. The exterior sources are things that we have on our outside, the things that we have that somehow we feel controlled by. So these things could be our phones. These things could be our computers, a TV, entertainment, something like that, a, an unhealthy relationship that is pushing us beyond the boundaries of where we feel comfortable. Anything that, like that that causes us to stumble, it's incredible what Jesus says. He says this in, in, in Matthew. He says, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. Now, if Jesus was literal, every single one of us would be handless and eyeless in this room. Okay, we all know that. Okay, let's all embrace it. We're all, we're all sinners here. It's all good. And here's the thing. Jesus isn't being literal, obviously. But what he's saying is you need to cut off these things in your life because they're less important than living the righteous life of Christ. It's more important that you cut these things off so that you can spend eternity with Christ. It's really important that we understand that. But also the other things that we can cut off and other sources are things that are happening on the inside. Oftentimes, why people struggle so deeply with addiction, things like pornography and drug and alcohol addictions and you know like our example from Josh Hamilton at the beginning is because they don't deal with the inner emotional things and so they use those things on the outside to medicate what's going on on the inside and so what you do instead is you say I'm going to deal with what's going on on my on the inside of my heart so that I can root these things out so that I can remove these sources of sin and so this is our third response is that we remove the sources of sin that keep us going back over and over again God's command was for complete annihilation of these, uh, these wicked, evil regimes and rulers and spiritual practices so that Israel can live as the kingdom of God. And so our job here, it's, Jesus is abundantly clear in the New Testament, is we've got to remove these things. We've got to cut these things out. Personally, in my life, this is where I've seen it, is as I've dug, I've dug before and had to dig really deep into my heart to find out why there were things in my life I struggled with and why I continued to feel these certain things that I, I felt. And sometimes when you do this kind of dirty work and you dig into your heart, you often remember and find things that you go, wow, I haven't thought about that for years. Like even they, you can go back, like for me, I went back to like elementary school and something that happened where I was bullied and kind of kicked out of a friend group as a fourth grader. I mean, that like, when you think about it as a fourth grader, you're like, ah, oh, you're okay, you'll be fine. Like, but as a fourth grader, that was so real and it stuck with me so that it made me feel later on in life that I wasn't loved, I wasn't cared about, I wasn't valuable enough to be cared about and liked by other people. And that that was an insidious lie that stuck into my heart forever until one day I just went, wait a minute. The Bible says something completely different. And so we look at it, we embrace truth and say that, and so instead, the statement that has to go through my head is, no, I am loved by God. I am valued by God, loved enough by God that he decided to come and die on the cross for me in the person of Jesus. That's the beauty of it, that Jesus just said, I love this, these people enough, I value these people enough that I'm going to come and give my life for them so that they can be brought back into a right relationship with me. When you start to believe those kinds of things and you find the root issue and then cover it over with truth, man, that cuts that, the source of that sin right off and you can live now in a full new life in Christ. And sometimes some of these things are environmental. It could be a place that you associate with sin and, and you just your brain makes that connection. Whatever it is, no matter what it is, you, it, it's our job to look around and say, God, help me to find these sources and to cut these off so that instead of living and, and giving myself into these lies, I can instead give myself into the truth of who Jesus is and what he has done for me and how he views me and how he sees me. Okay, we'll continue last, last paragraph here. Verse 30. Then Joshua built on Mount Ebal an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the Israelites, he built according to what is written in the book of the law of Moses. 
an altar of uncut stones on which no iron tool had been used. On it they offered to the Lord burnt offerings and sacrificed fellowship offerings. There in the presence of the Israelites, Joshua wrote on stones a copy of the law of Moses. All the Israelites with their elders, officials, and judges were standing on both sides of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, facing the Levitical priests who carried it. Both the foreigners living among them and the native-born were there. Half of the people stood in front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had formally commanded when he gave instructions to bless the people of Israel. Afterward, Joshua read all the words of the law, the blessings and the curses, just as it is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read to the whole assembly of Israel, including the women and children and the foreigners who lived among them. I would say, just a side note, we're quite fortunate that we're not sitting here reading in the entire book of the law as part of our services, because that would take a while. <laughs> like our services are about an hour long. This, that would, I don't even want to think about how long that would take. But what you have here is you actually have this kind of ceremony. It's a renewal of the covenant. And they're basically, Israel has, you know, realized, okay, they've made this mistake. They sinned as a nation, and now God has redeemed them, and now they're living in this new way of thinking that they're dependent on God, and they've conquered the city of Ai and followed through on the plans that he has given them, so now they want to renew the covenant. And in some ways, we could look at this as almost like a, a personal, like, recommitment to Christ, where we just say, okay, I've made this mistake, I've sinned, I, this is what I got, I got to recommit. But as part of this, why they're reading the law is that they're basically reminding themselves of the standard that has been placed before them. The standard that has been placed before them is of this, they look at this law and it says, this, this is what you're supposed to be. And if you're going to be a follower, if you're going to be a person of God, it's, it's about perfection. But what they realize is that they can't do the perfection on their own. We all know that. As Christians, we know this. This is something that's very clear in the New Testament. We cannot muster up enough righteousness on our own to be able to stand before God and have a perfect relationship with him. And the law was supposed to be this tutor that basically had Israel look at it and say, yep, we can't do it. We don't have enough righteousness in and of ourselves. And so we have to trust in something else, something greater than us. And what they did with these sacrifices, the sacrifices, when you kind of analyze them, actually in uh, the book of Leviticus in particular, when you look at them, these are all foreshadows of the person of Jesus and what Jesus would eventually do on the cross. And so the, looking to these sacrifices, they knew that the, the blood of of, of goats and rams could not forgive them of their sins. That's not what did it. It was the foreshadow of having faith in God providing a future lamb that would come and sacrifice himself for them. And so as Christians, we have the benefit of being able to look back and seeing that this has now happened, that Jesus has come. He has paid the price. But what we often do as Christians is we sometimes forget to renew and refresh ourselves in this idea over and over again. We begin to believe that somehow we just, we believe at one time and then, okay, we're good to go. Now I can go forward and do what I need to do for the rest of my life. But instead, what we need to do, and this is our fourth response, is to continually refresh ourselves with the heart of the gospel. That every, I mean, I would even say every day, I mean, as many times even a day that you can do it to refresh yourself, to remind yourself that this is the power of God to save you, that it is only through him and his work, what Jesus did on the cross, that it is anywhere possible that you could be righteous enough for God. This is the only thing that could happen. The, the, the gospel teaches us this. The gospel reminds us of this. And then it reminds us as well. It frees us from, from this belief that whenever we've sinned, that that's the end of our story. It frees us from that idea because we know that Jesus is continuing to work. Our story isn't completely over. And so when we understand who Jesus is and what he has done for us, we can know that one of his goals is to root out and dig out these um, these sources of sins in our life so that we could live in freedom for him, to live a life that pleases him. But this only happens when you continually refresh yourself with this idea. If you take it for granted and forget about it, then don't be surprised if you start to struggle with your Christian faith. So every time, every time you're convicted of your sin, don't hide from him. Run to him every single time. Come before him, lay yourself down at the cross and say, God, I still need your forgiveness. I still need your redemption in my life. And that he offers still full forgiveness each and every time. So we need to remember that the heart of the gospel says to us that we are never too far gone from God's redemption. 
We're never too far gone. We have never sinned to the point where forgiveness is not possible. It is always possible. And God is continuing to work even to use our mistakes and failures for his glory and our good in growing closer to him. So I want to close by giving you a little bit more of my personal story. I've struggled for years and years and years with depression. And then, you know, I, nowadays it's more like a, a day. Like I just have a day and it's just a, a bad day and it just, things don't seem to go right. I just get really frustrated and, and I just feel that general melancholy feeling, just kind of, uh, um, but for a while it was actually a time where I had to be on medication uh, and I was really struggling, even to the point where I was actually in ministry. I was a youth pastor at a different church, and they eventually came to me and they said, we think you need to step down from your job because you need to get healed. You need to get, you need to get yourself taken care of. And in my heart, in my mind, I'm going, wait, no, 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 you're my church, you're my family. Aren't you supposed to be like the ones who take care of me, who, provide, who, who will you know, surround me with support and help me get through this? And instead they said, no, we... We think you need to step out and step away. And in that hurt and in that time, I believed, I believed for a, a while that God wasn't going to get me another ministry job. That it's like, well, now I'm in that category of someone who had to step down from a ministry job and now I'm never gonna get back in ever again. And the point of I'm telling you this story is not because God eventually did provide another ministry job. That's not the point. The point is that what happened is that God had to rework my heart, begin to believe that there's no such thing as these fatal failures. That I needed to remember this. I needed to remember this truth, that in the eyes of God, there are no such things as fatal failures, but opportunities by which we can respond to God's immeasurable grace. And so God, in his grace and his mercy, worked in my life to root out those sins, those, the sources of the sins, to redeem me, to, and he's still working in me. I'm not even close to where I, I would like to be, but I am a perfectionist, so that's a different story. Um, but God has been working. God does these things, and there is no such thing as a fatal failure. So this morning, don't believe that lie. Don't believe that because you've made a mistake, because you've had sin in your past and things that, you know, you have regrets and things like that, and there's guilt and shame that God is done, that God is finished, or that God even won't work some miracle in your life so that you can be a, an influence and an encouragement for others. All right, let's pray. God, thank you so much. God, I'm so thankful for your word and who you are and what you do for us. God, we completely give ourselves to you. God, we thank you that you, you don't give up on us. God, that even when there's sin in our lives, when there's mistakes that we make, God, there's choices um, that we regret. God, that you don't give up, that you keep working, you keep refining, you keep changing us. So God, we thank you for that. We give this all to you and we pray this in your name. Amen.